Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, Commissioner Harrison, if you'd like, we can dive uh, right in uh, to the next hearing. All right. Uh, thank you and good evening again, Council President and Mayor elect, Vice President Middleton, Chairman Schleifer, and Vice Chairman Burnett, and members of the Council. Thank you again for the opportunity to present this evening. Let me begin by giving a brief overview of the current crime situation. As of today, we're seeing year to date reductions in total property crime by 30%, including 32% reductions in robberies, 27% reductions in burglaries, 34% reduction in larcenies, 22% reductions in auto thefts. Thank you. All right. All of that's good news and that's welcome. However, while total violent crime is down a total of 19%, of course, homicides and non-fatal shootings still remain extremely challenging. We're currently down 3% yeah. in homicides and down 6% in the number of non-fatal shooting victims. But let me be very clear. This is only dissemination of information and certainly not touting or celebration of this information, considering how horrible and how bad our murder rate and shooting rate were last year. However, it's important to highlight where we are and then compare it to what's happening elsewhere in the country. For example, the major city chiefs associations surveyed nearly 70 largest police departments in America that all report that through the third quarter of this year, homicides are up 29% and then aggravated assaults, which include non federal shootings are up over 10%. Of those 69 cities, Baltimore is only one of 10 showing a decrease in total violent crime, namely murder, shootings, and robberies. And then only one of three showing decreases in all the crime categories. Now, most of the other departments are showing sharp increases in most of, if not all, the crime categories. And again, this is not touting or celebrating this information, but rather always working to understand where we are and what we need to do to improve. Now, as I said during our previous hearing, I'd rather be down than up. And the same goes that I'd rather be going against this national trend than seeing us following along with it. Those cities are now experiencing the similar forms of social reckoning and the familiar surges of violence that Baltimore experienced back in 2015, and the one that unfortunately we're still in the midst of seeing. However, those cities and those departments are in the infancy of their reform efforts, while we'll, we are well ahead of the curve in comparison. Now, while we're seeing some modest progress, let me assure you that it is not good enough for me. It is not good enough for my executive team. It's not good enough for any of my commanders. I know it's not good enough for Mayor Lex Scott or for the rest of the council, all the residents who you all represent. So this Thursday, we'll celebrate Thanksgiving, COVID notwithstanding. It's usually an occasion to be with family, even if it's only virtually this year. And that is what I am sure many others are going to do and are thankful for, that we get to be with our loved ones. However, as we celebrate, we do so knowing that for far too many families in Baltimore, this will not be the case. That is because this week we mark another event, one we do not celebrate, but rather one we solemnly recognize as the grim and somber occasion for which it signifies. We saw the, 30, the 300th homicide record in the city this year. We do so for the sixth straight year in a row. This culture of violence, specifically gun violence, has left a lot of empty chairs around the Thanksgiving dinner table, tragically thousands of them. So where do we go from here? And how do we make far further and more significant reductions in the rate of homicides and shootings? You've heard me say many times, as well as our mayor, let's speak about the importance of really being focused on the bad actors committing these crimes and the focus deterrence and group violence intervention strategies. As an update, you'll see on the Board of Estimates agenda tomorrow, the ratification of an agreement with Northeastern University will provide technical assistance and subject matter expertise in the development, implementation, and evaluation of this upcoming program. The board will also accept several grant awards to fund the first year of this program. So I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the ABLE Foundation, Johns Hopkins University, the Baltimore Community Foundation for stepping up and funding this important initiative. So is focused deterrence the strategy that will help us make further reductions in violent crime, namely shootings and murders, it's certainly one component of it. This strategy incorporates the five pillars of prevention, intervention, rehabilitation, reentry, and targeted enforcement. And within it, it will assist us in better focusing our efforts around 
most at-risk individuals so that we can break the cycle and culture of violence and retribution. <clears throat> but focused deterrence is only one part of a larger strategy. You hear me talk all the time about reform, and I often get criticized sometimes for perhaps focusing what some would say too much on our consent decree or changing the culture of the department. But focusing on reform allows us to rebuild the trust of the communities we serve. It ensures we're policing fairly, equitably, and constitutional. Most importantly, it ensures we are managing our resources as efficiently and effectively as possible. All of our reform efforts will lead to a better run department that will in turn be able to be more effective and prevent, deter, and reduce crime in our neighborhoods. For example, our new records management system will not only keep track of our department's operations, but it will allow us to comply with the mandates of the consent decree and increase our case management capabilities, which will lead to better managed, stronger cases in court. When we talk about better training, yes, it's a mandate of the consent decree, but it's also not just some academic exercise. It's designed to ensure we're giving officers the most effective tools and overall approaches, as well as the confidence that they need so that they can go out and do their job properly and productively. Since the beginning of the training of last year, we've received overwhelmingly positive feedback on our stop, search, and arrest training, with some officers calling it the best training they've ever received with BPD. When I talk about overtime reform, yes, one purpose for it is being good fiscal stewards of the taxpayer dollar, but it also allows us to focus our scarce resources and use them where operationally it makes the most impact and ensures that we're not overworking our officers and asking too much of them. Crime reduction and department transformation are not mutually exclusive, but rather are two parts of a greater whole. As we continue to make these necessary advancements, modernizations, and reforms, BPD will continue to transform into a world-class department able to better address crime in our neighborhoods. So I'd like to wish you and your families and everyone in the city of Baltimore a very happy, healthy, and safe Thanksgiving. And right now, I'll hand the presentation over to my Deputy Commissioner of Operations, Michael Sullivan, and Colonel Worley and Bristol to go into further detail on the current crime situation. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, uh, Councilman Schleifer and uh, Mayor Elect. Uh, thank you for uh, allowing us to be here today to present these uh, crime statistics uh, that we have uh, experienced this year. You'll see this first slide that's up speaks to what the commissioner uh, spoke to in his opening remarks. Uh, you'll see that these slides started from last Saturday, the 11th, or ended last Saturday, the 21st. Uh, I just want to make that clear for that's when the date occurred. Uh, I'm going to focus on just those uh, two areas where we uh, identify that they're in the red. Uh, if you remember at the start of COVID, we had this, uh, several pattern cases of residential robberies that drove up uh, that number high. We've made several arrests and have been getting closer and closer uh, to, to getting that number in the black as well. Uh, we also had uh, us couple uh, pattern cases you'll see in the arsons uh, category where we're three cases over where, where we were last year and uh, those cases uh, we were able to make arrests to uh, at this point we can go through uh, district by district and we can pass it over to Colonel Worley if, uh, if that's the uh, that's what you would like Yeah, you don't need to go line by line, district by district, but if you can just give uh, give an overview. Yeah, we, we can just touch on the areas that were up in each district, and uh, I'll pass it over to Colonel Worley to just uh, give a high-level overview of the districts. Yep, good evening. Um, the only area that we're up in in the, in the uh, year-to-date in the central are the homicides, and that's because they had a, they had a really good year last year. They have... Um, 14 homicides this year compared to 12 last year. Um, they're by far the, the lowest in the city. And then they have arsons nine compared to five um, last year, which is still a minimal number. Everything else is in the green and they're having a really good year, especially with street robberies are down 54% in the central district. So they're, they're, they're doing well with the robberies. Moving on to the Southeast, the areas that are up are the rates are up 42% in the Southeast. Um, and then the home invasions are up 29%. That's the area where we've seen um, a huge increase 
in the southeast, but they were up as high as 70 to 80 percent um, year to date. And May the 2nd, we were 67 percent up in home invasions. And as of the 21st, we're only 24 percent up. It's still up, but we've cut that dramatically um, recently. And that's because some uh, really good arrests from uh, when we were having them. Um, Spanish families being targeted. We made some good arrests in there and we were able to, to put some people away with that. One. So do you have any other questions about those two or you want me to go and just continue? Now you can continue unless a member of the committee has a specific question about that. You can just pipe, jump in. I do. So this is Councilwoman Shannon Sneed. And so in our area in the south um, east where some of the jump was, um, I felt like there enough information wasn't being released to um, the area to let neighbors and members know since we're not having the uh, monthly police meetings at the district. I think it would be really helpful if we can get some of this information out to the president um, to make them aware of what's going on and just, you know, being cognizant of their areas, especially as we move into the holiday season when we know um, crime sometimes increases around this time. Yes, I, I agree. They should be putting stuff out on their Facebook page and communicating with the community council presidents and everyone in every neighborhood present. The district commanders um, should be sending out information and putting stuff on all the social media networks, advising of this is this is a time of year when our street robberies increase, but. Just to give you a quick up, I went back and looked on um, well, May the second, the Northeast was 211% up in home invasions, and they've come all the way down to where they're only 29% up. So they they uh, they have done um, a really good job with that. But, um, I we will make sure I will make sure the major and captain there are communicating a great deal with the with the community. I know the cap the major is out um, for a week. But the captain is there. I spoke to her. As a matter of fact, I just got a text from her a little while ago. And I just want to remind people too that due to COVID, a lot of our seniors um, are not able to go to these meetings. And there is a technology divide. And some of the commute there, I'm getting feedback. Um, and so they're not able to have the same access because some of our seniors, many of our seniors, are not on Facebook. They're not going to check social media because they're not there. So I just want to make sure we um, recognize that there is definitely a, a, a digital divide between those between the older seniors as well, um, since they're not able to go to those community meetings. And so that's why I'm like, it's helpful if they can ha pick up the phone and call some of these presidents because they still, many of the seniors in our communities still have that old fashioned phone tree uh, working when they get on the phone and they talk to one another and they pass messages that way. So um, I'm just asking if you guys can also um, pick up the phone and call some of these senior presidents so they can let our community members know what's going on. Uh, this is Commissioner Harrison. We're, we're happy to set those kinds of protocols up not just for your district, but for all of them, uh, so that we can, you know, we can put the information out in real time uh, through technology. But for those that are part of the uh, the digital divide, we can we can find the protocol to to make sure everybody is connected, and we're happy to do that. Thank Commissioner, you. On, Commissioner, on that on that point, also to echo uh, Councilwoman Sneed's uh, sentiments. This is something that has come up in previous hearings where uh, we need to increase the engagement with the community, especially during uh, COVID uh, when community meetings and other meetings aren't really taking place. And an issue had come up and was brought, uh, I brought to this committee uh, hearing last month and I think two months ago as well, uh, that some of the CRC meetings are not open to the public and are rather by invitation only. And so what I would ask uh, is that if uh, there's community relations council meetings, which people don't differentiate between the police department and you know those operating it, um, if they're not doing what they're designated to do, which is to build uh, relationships between the community and the police, I would just say that maybe we go ahead with uh, Councilwoman Sneed's idea and hold monthly meetings uh, for each uh, district, for each police district, and have the council people in each one of those districts 
um, be able to open open those meetings up and invite everybody to come and get a monthly briefing from their captains and commanders uh, and have that open to the public. So that's, that's, that's something I've certainly been talking with my commanders about. That's something we've talked to the CRC presidents about. As a matter of fact, at our last, you know, I meet with, I meet with the CRC presidents every month. And at our most recent meeting, we did a poll of all of them to find out how the meetings have been gone, going. Most have not even been having meetings this year. Some have, but some have not. And some have had them in recent weeks or months, but certainly when COVID first started, uh, there was probably a long period where there were no meetings by some of them and only a few meetings by some of them. Uh, so it's something that we certainly uh, want to design to make sure everybody is connected and there's good information flow uh, to those through technology and for those who don't use technology. All right, and I think that it's, it's just counterproductive if we have majors and captains participating in meetings that were designated to uh, build relationships between the community and the police department and those meetings are by invitation only um, that's counterproductive and so I think that uh, the majors and those captains um, you know if people want to have a private meeting with them that's that's their prerogative people are entitled to, to request those meetings from uh, the majors and the captains and they can schedule them accordingly uh, but I think meetings that are designated to be wide open to the community uh, need to do just that. And so I'm, I'm not understanding why the majors and captains would even go into those meetings and provide crime briefings um, and, and engage with uh, activity that um, that's basically um, silencing a lot of voices in the community and not in, in allowing engagement for those that are interested in engaging. Got it. Yes, sir. And I, I just want to add, this is Councilwoman Shannon Sneed again. Our um, contact in the Eastern did send out an email um, for us to start meeting. Um, and they said Zoom. And I said, that's fine because people can, you know, the seniors can also jump on the phone lines when they do Zoom. There's a line for phones. But it just also lets, let us know that certain areas are on the radar where I'm getting a lot of calls for certain areas like um, Patterson Park and Biddle and, um, Mill and Monford, and so those meetings just help connect the dots with keeping those people informed. Uh, thank you. Yeah, and we, we did something yesterday that Michelle put together and Lindsay put together for us. Um, we have a new major and a new captain in the Northeast, and we did a Zoom call, um, and they had 50, over 50 participants in it, and it only lasted one hour. So that I really like that. I was on the whole time, and I think we're going to have the, the district commanders each put one of those together. And it had every community um, president was invited to come to that. And, and uh, I think as long as we keep it to a point, a reasonable amount of time, that's not a, a big ask of our district commanders. Can you tell, this is need again. Can you tell us how many actually called in? Was this Zoom and call in? Yes, it was both. They could they could have either one. Most of them were on Zoom, but there were several people um, that called in. There there were some challenges um, with the Zoom, but it, it went by really well, and and uh, it, it turned out really really well. Um, it was a really good um, hour, and then the district commander stayed on for about fifteen or twenty minutes later, um, and took all the questions that they had. They were able to type their questions or ask them um, right on the Zoom. But it, it gave we gave both options. Perfect. Yay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. All right, Colonel, do you want to finish your presentation? Yeah, moving into the Eastern, um, the the residential robberies in the Eastern are up, are up as well. They're up 56%. Um, the commercial robberies are up slightly at the two. Um, the forcible rates were up 12%. Rates even were down. And then your miscellaneous is six to five. Those are smaller numbers, but the residential robberies are up. The eastern and the southeast is where we were getting hit earlier. Um, and the, the big one um, was when we made a couple of arrests, all those numbers have come down dramatically. And then arson is up 19 compared to six. All right, moving on to the northeast, your homicides are up 
9%, three more homicides this year than they had last year. The residential robberies are up in the Northeast as well, which they were up in almost every every district thus far, um, except for the Central. They're, they're leading in most of your robbery categories. And your ag assault, ag assaults are up 3%. They've been battling a little bit with the aggravated assaults um, for a little bit of time. And a majority, well, about a third of those are domestic related. 261 of the 721 are domestic related. The Northern, they, they've had a tough year, but um, the reason they had such a tough year is for the last five or six years, their crime categories have gone down in the double digits. So it's hard to keep that, that downward trend in the double digits. Their homicides are up slightly, 22 to 19. Shootings are up slightly, 54 to 46. Um, and they've struggled in every every crime, I mean, every robbery category, with the exception of the street robberies, which are down significantly, that keeps them down um, for the year at 15%. Their ag assaults have, have also increased 8%, and their arsons are up 6 compared to 3. Northwest, they've, they've recovered nicely. At, at one point, they were up in homicides. They're now down um, 42 compared to 39, which still is not a celebration, but it's at least it's lower than it was last year. Um, your residential robberies, just like everything, and home invasions in the Northwest are up, just like all the rest of the districts. The other two robbery categories are up slightly. But as you see overall, every every uh, crime category is down except for those subcategories in the robberies and the uh, rape categories. The Western, they're having um, a pretty decent year, but their crime categories are down. Everything except for a couple um, subcategories and robberies are up slightly. The Western is the, uh, the district that's struggled the most this year with homicides and shootings. They've got 51 homicides compared to 46 last year, um, and they have 110 uh, shootings compared to 79 last year, which is which is quite an increase. And that's the district that struggled with the with the violence all year. Although their robberies are down, um, overall robberies are down. A couple of subcategories are up slightly. And then lastly, the, the Southern, um, their robberies are up 34 to 25. I mean, I'm sorry, their homicides 34 to 25. A couple subcategories of the robberies are up and their arsons are up slightly, but the Southern is having, um, having a good year with the other uh, high crime, I mean, violent crime categories. And that's, that takes care of the nine districts. Colonel, um, I noticed like in the subcategories, and um, if I'm reading this incorrectly, uh, please correct me, but I see how it says um, residential robberies are up 24%. Um, but then when you go down to burglaries, they're down 27%. So are they simply considered robberies because there's people in the homes now because more people are working from home? No, the rob it's considered a robbery because there's some kind of personal contact with the victim. Um, the burglaries, they just go into the homes and they steal steal products, steal items. Um, but if in the robberies, they have to have some kind of contact where they take the property by force from the individual. Right. So, no, I understand that. I'm, I'm asking more, uh, more specifically the fact that people are home during the day. Is that to explain the increase in the residential robberies. Obviously, if people weren't home while it's being robbed, it would just be a burglary. Yes, it very, so, very well could be because it, it is more more people are home, so we're running, we're, we're, we're getting into more confrontations with people. But for the most part, um, it was a targeted um, crew of uh, people that were doing home invasions earlier in the year that, uh, that happened. And, there, and there's some domestic ones as well. Um, where they force themselves in, but you're you're absolutely right. It's it's uh, what um, as far as that uh, that time that you were talking about, because I mean, I obviously I see it happening also in the Northwest. Um, what what time of day were those were those uh, residential robberies occurring? 
um, and where throughout the city or during the yeah the the um, the increase that you were referencing were those daytime or nighttime? Oh yeah, I'm sorry. I was the deputy was telling me something about the the what once you one of the biggest things that you run into when you have a a residential robbery. Um, and I'll, I'll get to you. I didn't forget your question, sir, but they were happening all different times. But when you run into with the residential robberies, if you run into when you go into a house, if there's four or five people, that's four or five separate robbery. Um, so those numbers can escalate pretty quickly. But for the most part, I believe when we were getting hit with the Spanish, um, they were they were targeting Spanish families. And, and that one was, I believe, during the day and, and early morning. Um, pattern but that one has been solved we, we actually made arrests on those and they were hitting Baltimore County with that as well because Baltimore County helped us um, solve those those issues they were just like sort of like the carjacking thing with them that was going back and forth with the county they were hitting both of us um, and we worked together to put the put both of those patterns down gotcha and is that I know this has come up before in the past but is that something that you guys were taking a look at as far as reporting each one of those as separate as separate robberies um, as opposed to just per incident in a residence well it's it's a ucr it's the way it has to be recorded um okay. uniform crime reporting by the fbi has to count each individual um as a robbery victim but we know like if it was one house and there was four victims we we know that that they were multiple victims but when you count the numbers you got to count each person who was robbed as a as a as a separate victim gotcha okay and also in the um in, in the report there's it also showing how uh, narcotics arrests are down i think it was like 55 percent um trying to find that slide um why why are um no it's more than 55 percent why are uh, the arrests down so much and are those arrests people who are distributing or those are arrests were typically people who just had narcotics on them the vast majority the vast majority of those are misdemeanor uh, arrests that are occurring and if you recall at the start of uh, uh, the COVID experience there were certain uh, certain crimes that were not being prosecuted uh, so with that uh, that's where we see the big drop uh, and it's generally in the in the misdemeanor crime category uh, for possession. And do you have this broken down by um, by possession versus distribution? I do. I'll ask uh, Colonel Herzog. I believe he has those details, and he can speak to them. Yeah, so, excuse me. Somebody jumping in. Yeah, um, go ahead. Uh, and, <laughs> yep. So as far as the exact numbers go. Um, we know based on the state's attorney's office, they provided data that um, a misdemeanor drug arrests are down by 75% this year. And that's based on the policies that were put in place regarding the, in the COVID procedures. So it's down and misdemeanor drug arrests are down by 75% this year. And so these, uh, this dramatic reduction of arrests, are those are those misdemeanor ones or are those also, is there also a reduction in uh, distribution arrests? So we know that the, and the majority of the significant reduction is in the misdemeanor arrests. Um, and, and uh, you know, as well as felony as well, but the significant reduction is in the misdemeanor arrests. Okay. Well, I can tell you, we definitely feel it as far as the distribution side, because uh, there's the same, same spots continue to be uh, problematic. Um, I know that in my council district, but also I hear from my colleagues, uh, certain locations in their council districts um, as well. Um, before we go into uh, into some more questions, is there any members of the committee that have any questions on this? Chairman, this is Councilman Pinkett. I, I have some questions. Go ahead, go ahead Councilman Thank Pinkett. Um, Colonel Worley, um, just um, last month, um, I requested some and, and received some information um, on a specific four block radius around uh, from Cary and Cumberland in the Western District. And um, <clears throat> when I looked at that data over the uh, past five years, um, just in that four, that four block area, um, 
we are averaging 14 homicides a year, so that's over one a month. Um, 26 shootings a year, so that's more than two a month. Over 100 robberies a year, um, almost 10 a month. 100, 128 aggra aggravated assaults a year. Um, one carjacking a month. Um, one commercial, one business robbed a month. Um, almost 120 burglaries a year, and just in this four blocks. Um, and then when I look at the statistics that you gave even tonight, it looks like a quarter of the homicides in Western, a quarter of the shootings, a quarter of the robbing, robberies, um, a quarter of the aggravated assaults, burglaries, carjackings, all happen in this four block area. How do we for so many years, you know, I mean, if, if we controlled that four blocks, it would change West Baltimore. What, I, what, what, I guess, what are we doing? What, what are we not doing? H how do we change this? I mean, we can't go every year with these same statistics in just the same four block area. Yeah, I, I agree, Councilman. Actually, I'm very familiar with that area. It was my post when I was an officer. Pensy, Pensy and North, I mean, Pensy and Cumberland, um, Pensy and North, that little area right there. We have officers assigned there every single day, 24 7. Our K 9 unit is stationed. Basically, they are to park at Cumberland and Cary, I mean, Cumberland and Pensy, and they walk that area. The Western has an officer station at North and uh pensy and they walk that area mta has two officers yeah. that work that area the western has a district action team that is assigned to that area um, a lot of the issues that we run into there um, are precipitated or or link cause are other issues that the police department really can't control like the addiction the addiction rate in that area is extremely high um, the businesses there we've we've tried to close a couple businesses there using the padlock but we are unable to do that because we can't link it directly to their business if it happens right in that area there's not um, we can't link it to a business we can't close it because of the business so we we are throwing every resource we had at it when we did the VRIs we, we mm -hmm. actually had all the other city agencies in there helping us um, and we still utilize them and we still have officers assigned there um, it's just a hub for um, a, so many people in that such that small area. Almost every shooting or every incident we get there is something an officer was right there around the corner and they simply just wait for the officer to walk a half a block away and, and we have an incident. It's frustrating. It's been frustrating for all of us um, getting trying to get a control of that small area, but you're exactly right. Um, that we, we do have to get a control of that. We are putting more resources there. We're trying to use all these city wraparound services hey, to help us. Yeah, because and, and I don't I don't know what is the appropriate, you know, number of arrests. But but when I looked at um, CDS arrest um, with, I guess, a felony charge in that same four block area, it's 10 arrests a month so one every three days and I, I i mean i just it just seems like you could make a cds arrest with felony charge like one every three hours in that four block area not one every three days well well the felony charge is you actually have the officer actually have has to witness the person selling the drugs if we we could probably and we we have done in the past where we can make multiple possession cases but those aren't being prosecuted so it's it's not it, we, we basically can't do those so the officer has to do observation and actually watch the dealer sell the product to the buyer before they can pretty much take action they have to do a search and seizure warrant um, on the property and as you know there's a lot of businesses there so if they go into the business um, we have to prove that the business is complicit in, in the in illegal activity to try to shut them down yeah, I mean, obviously, this isn't the form, but if we don't if we don't figure out the the prosecution along with the arrest and make certain that they're coordinated, I, I, 
I don't even I don't even know how you all do your job because you 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 can't if you if you can't make those possession arrests, um, that area is going to remain so lucrative, and then there's going to be rivals coming in trying to get some of that money, and it and it's going to stay violent. And so we we got to have everybody working together, um, from the state's attorney's office to BPD, um, to probation and parole, or we we we're, we're not going to solve this. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Thank you. Any other members of the committee have any questions? This is neat. I, I do have a question because we're, when we're talking about arrest, and I just, and I can hold off on this question to the end, but I saw the governor's press conference and he was talking about making arrests during, you know, COVID and over the holidays. And it just brings up concerns to me, one, because here it is that we're talking about arrests being in our area over people who are actually doing crimes. And so I'm wondering, since the governor said he had the support of the local jurisdictions, um, has the um, commissioner and I guess the governor spoken about this and will it be in, in patrols in Baltimore City for COVID and set of crimes in Baltimore City? So, so council member, this is Commissioner Harrison. I have spoken with, uh, Colonel Jones, the superintendent of the state police. And he and I are coordinating uh, state troopers coming into the city uh, to help us with our social club task force and enforcing the governor's executive orders uh, regarding you know, COVID enforcement. Uh, certainly, we have always said, you know, we want to make sure people are voluntarily complying. And if and when we need to take action against establishments like restaurants, bars, other businesses that are in non-compliant, we will do that. But certainly we can't, uh, you know, nobody has the capacity to enforce and make arrests because people won't wear a mask out in public. Uh, so what we want to do is educate our community and make sure we are enforcing, but getting people to voluntarily comply. And he's, he's sending troopers in, but the superintendent of the state police and I are coordinating. That's who I've spoken to, not directly with the governor. And we're on the same page about what we're going to be doing regarding enforcing that executive order. And it, it's not going out just making arrests. It's it's getting people to voluntarily comply. Thank you. 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 Relevant to an incident that took place moments before the uh, previous hearing started, what what is the um, the rule within uh, BPD for an officer who's not compliant with the mask mandate? Well, we put out a memorandum that we want officers to follow the guidelines that came out of certainly the health department uh, and our, our health commissioner and from our police department about when and where to wear a mask and we have been sending our compliance team in all of our districts and in all of our divisions to do random inspections and audits and we've produced reports that we even presented uh to the judge the monitors and the doj just last week on those compliance and audit checks now when we find people who are in non-compliance then you know we can begin pro progressive discipline on employees when we see that they're willfully violating. And, you know, but once we know that a person is willfully violating it, yeah, progressive discipline can be forthcoming because we've given a mandate for people to do it. What we always have to do is to find out if the if the mandate made its way down to the officer and the officer actually knows that the mandate was given. Uh, you know, we feel confident that they do. Yeah, and I, I would agree. I know that at least in my council district, my majors uh, from the police districts in my district um, do an excellent job at relaying that information and have been on top of that. And I've I've per personally witnessed compliance checks because, you know, when they do roll calls and stuff in the parking lot, I've seen um, I've seen them doing checks and, and going through that. So is there is there something you can, you know, give an example on what some of this uh, progression looks like? I mean, what kind of consequences we're talking about or is it really a case by case it's it's case by case and you know it you know we don't we don't jump straight to termination certainly there are counseling sessions and 
uh, uh, supervisory discussions and counseling sessions and redirections that we can do. And when there's repeat violations, you know, we can we can progressively move to to you know more progressive discipline. Uh, but what we want to do is condition our employees to wear the mask. We don't want to you know really turn this into a a disciplinary thing. We want this to be a health a health issue and for people to comply because of health reasons. Uh, and listen, the city safety czar is actually helping us with these audit checks. And so compliance and the safety czar are going around and, and doing them. And what we're finding is that when we first started, we found some non-compliance. But as we educated um, more members of our department, the audits began to look a lot better. And, and now we're finding more often than not, people are actually complying. OK, thank you. Uh, and one one last thing that I have um, that was not included in the presentation and has been a priority of this committee since uh, since the start uh, has been the clearance rates. So if you can have um, somebody just go through our year to date clearance rates. Uh, yeah, I have I have my colonel go through the clearance rates, but let me just let me say this to all of you when you know I had uh, some of the issues with some of the exceptional clearances and i actually uh commissioned an audit uh by the consent decree monitoring team uh by way of our uh compliance team and that uh audit went on for a couple of months and so to make sure we were above board and to make sure with regard to exceptional clearances we were following ucr guidelines and making sure we were in compliance uh, i wanted to make sure that we were above board so i commissioned that audit and our um, our compliance team, but with uh, the monitors overseeing them, conducted that audit. While we can't go into the results because we just recently shared it with the consent decree monitor team, uh, you know we can't tell you that it's complete. We can't tell you that the monitors are are reviewing the results. Okay. Which uh, which colonel do you have presenting? Good afternoon. I'm sorry. Good evening. This is Colonel Briscoe speaking. Hi, Colonel. Um, yes, myself and Colonel Wool are going to tag team this because we both have uh, both sides of this coin, if you will. So, sure. if um, if I may, so as of today, the clearance rate for the UCR clearance rate for homicide is at 39 percent. The clearance rate for our sexual offenses is at. Can you, um, Colonel? I'm sorry to interrupt. Can you also just give the year to date, so this year and last year, by comparison? I certainly can. Thank you. Just bear with me one moment. So uh, our year to date clearance uh, today is at 39%. This time last year, we were at 31%. For the case of uh, clearance rate for rape, we're at 40%. I'm sorry, our sex offense, we're at 40, 40%. Last year, we were at 46%. For our child abuse clearance rate, we're at 17% year to date. And we were at 31% this time last year. For our arson cases, we are at 34% this year. In 2019, we were at 44%. For our economic crimes, we're at 37% in 2020 and at 32% in 2019, respectfully. And I will turn it over to uh, Colonel Woolley to provide the additional uh, clearance rates. Yeah. Yes, sir. I can. I can. Get, I don't have the breakdown from the clearance rates from last year, but I can give you what this. What, I have it broke down by district, but I know the clearance rate for the shootings is pretty similar to what was last year. Um, they're sitting right now. They're sitting at twenty percent. Um, the citywide clearance rate for robberies is thirty percent. Um, the citywide clearance rate for burglaries is nineteen percent. And for ag assaults is 30, 37%. Um, obviously a couple of districts are doing a little better than others. Um, and I can get into those if you if you'd like, but the the overall um, the clearance rates for robberies and burglaries is above the national average. For robberies and burglaries, you're saying? Yes, or above the national average. And I assume we're pointing that out because in probably in all the other categories it's below the average ag assaults is pretty close it's right around 40 percent 
and the our our rate is thirty seven percent. The shooting just is, is uh, the national average. I, I believe is right around um, twenty five to thirty percent. But I'm not on that. And what what about with with homicides? Are you asking about the uh, the national average? Yes. Yes. Jack, do you have that in front of you? Yes, ma'am. And so the national average was fifty nine and a half percent last year. So almost 60 percent. And we're at what are we at right now? You said. Thirty nine. What was that? Thirty nine percent. Right. So, I mean, you know, this is this has been an ongoing issue. Um, can, really can, I jump in one, can I jump in one second, Councilman? Sure. The, the, just keep in mind, there's a lot of underlying context that we never really get to talk about when we talk about national averages, because the the average police department in America among the 18,000 police departments is under 20 police officers. And so the national average is calculated with the 70 biggest police departments that have 1,000 or more, which there's only 70. The rest of the department, the rest of the country, is made up of the 18,000, but most departments are under 100, but most in the small rural areas are either under 20. And they actually contribute to the national average. So it is, it's a, it's, it's, I don't want you to think we're making excuses because we don't, we need to be, be a lot higher. But uh, I think it's comparing big cities to big cities is more applicable than comparing big cities to the rest of the country. Because it, you know, countries that have one, perhaps one murder a year and solve it or at hundred percent. So right. we, we, we certainly need to improve. There's no, look, don't, don't, please don't mishear me. We need great improvement, but thinking about the national average, I just wanted to give that context. Right. And I, I, I hear you. I hear you on that. I mean, the thing that's more, I was just asking that more for context to understand okay. gotcha. the, the, the scope. And, and I certainly get that. Um, the bigger concern for me is that somebody has a 61% chance of getting away with murder in yeah. Baltimore city. And so as you can imagine, and you see, we're dealing with a lot of the same offenders, um, these, these violent repeat offenders. Uh, and so, you know, when we have a 61% chance, when you solve each one of those, it's not just solving that one crime. Often I'm sure you guys find there's connections to multiple other crimes. Uh, I know, I know that's the case. Um, uh, but in addition to that, it also is taking a violent repeat offender, um, who may be responsible for multiple shootings and multiple homicides uh, off the street. And so, you know, this is something I've been talking about since the first time you and I met. And so what, what are we doing now to, to get those clearance rates up, uh, in a significant manner to actually bring closure to the victims? Uh, witnesses and communities that that are being plagued by these uh, shootings, homicides, and other violent crimes. Well, first of all, thank you for that. We fully agree. Um, we had to create the right staffing model within homicide, uh, and you know we decentralized our shooting investigations out to the districts from the centralized approach uh, mid-year last year. But enhancing the staffing, we've we've now added 14 more members to the homicide unit, but we also rearranged the uh, the resource allocation and how we were deploying, uh, rather than deploying the majority by day, we've now equalized and levelized the staffing across the 24 hour for response to homicide, but making sure we can actually handle the cases that are coming in and the, the distribution of the cases per detective. Then we're working on making sure we train all of them through uh, actual formal training. Uh, we have historically relied on on-the-job training by pairing uh, new detectives up with senior detectives, but now we want to make sure through our public safety partnership that we bring on formal training to make sure everyone has the basic and the advanced courses in homicide investigations. Uh, and then there's just making sure we produce great cases, working with our state attorney, working with our federal partners, and utilizing the federal resources to connect all of these cases, as you talked about earlier, some of these perpetrators have committed multiple offenses and using that data to make sure that we're not just clearing the cases, but bringing justice to, to victims. All right. And so I had pointed out um, in, in previous years in the budget hearings, um, and this is also, um, this is prior to some different 
turnover in executive leadership. And so I wanted to point that out that it not necessarily reflective on the current the current leadership, but uh, you know, there was an increase of $17 million uh, directed towards that department. And I pointed that out in last year's budget, hearing how the clearance rates had actually gone down. Um, and that was after a $17 million increase in that department. So when you say getting new people in there and getting them trained properly, I mean, are we now with the new people you've put in there at the staffing level that you feel is appropriate? Or is there still a number of detectives that you feel it's still necessary to get into that department uh, and trained in order to start seeing the results that that we're expecting. You're muted. You're muted, Commissioner. I believe we're still understaffed, and we have a protocol about how we enhance staffing, not just there, but everywhere in the department. Um, but we're working to bring, like I said, formal training uh, to the homicide unit for those who've never had formal training and all the advanced courses. Uh, I still believe we're understaffed to get us at the case per detective ratio where we want to be. Uh, but you know, as we have this influx of homicides that come in, sometimes when we get there, just a surge of homicides would put you out of balance all over again. And what is uh, that case per detective number? Uh, well, the acceptable number is six to one. And I think we hover slightly above six. Six new, six new cases a year per detective. And if I'm correct, uh, <laughs> If I'm not correct, please correct me. Either Colonel yeah, so I, think, I think part of it is also making sure that uh, in, in determining that caseload, that we have the ability for detectives to be able to handle the case uh, and, and lead the case. So part of it is making sure they're properly trained to do so. So um, we can get you those. Figures. And so what what amount of uh, more resources are needed in that in that division in order to get the ratio that that you're referencing? Well, it's 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 resources, but it's also skill set and it's time that we need to bring detectives up to a skill set level where they can you know, be competent enough to handle those cases on their own without without partnering with someone and oversee them. That's number one. But it's also time that we need because we're also working to bring people in to st uh, staff up public integrity, to staff up. Uh, sexual assault investigations, the staff up patrol. And, and so we're constantly making those assessments and readjusting based on vacancies, based on promotions to backfill vacant promotions, and then making sure we move people into specialized assignments like homicide, sex crimes, SWAT, public integrity when vacancies arrive there and we didn't have shortages. So we're doing this every, the same thing in every section of the department all the time. Yeah, is, this in connection, is this in connection with the uh, with the staffing study that had been done? Um, doesn't it just outline a specific number so that we have a ballpark target? It does outline a, it does outline a specific number so we have a ballpark target. But to arrive at that, we we have a protocol to arrive at that as we bring on new recruits and they graduate and complete field training. We first backfill vacant positions that are vacated through promotions then through specialized assignments. Uh, in the last iteration of, we had to put a number of people in sexual assault because we were drastically short there and out of compliance with the consent decree. And so in order to meet a consent decree compliance and not be held in non-compliance or in contempt, uh, that was an action item that was immediate that we had to take. But we're always working to make sure when those recruits come online as officers, we look at how we, in increase the staffing in homicide along with some of the other units. Gotcha. Um, is there any other committee members or members of the council that have any questions? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Commissioner Harrison. Um, always a pleasure to see you and your staff. Um, yeah, the three, you know, whether it's 300 or um, however many, the homicides remain unrelenting in our city. Um, the retaliation killings, um, just just the rate of violent crime. Um, I'm curious, just given that, um, you know, we're continuing to see uh, during the pandemic, before the pandemic, 
such a high rate of crime. What is kind of the operating theory of what is driving our murder rate at the moment within the department? Is most of this about um, retaliation? What's kind of the the theory that you all are operating under on why you know we're continuing to have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people lose their lives each year in our city? Deputy Sullivan or Colonel Briscoe speak to it after me. Uh, what we're seeing is a, a number of these are uh, drug deals gone bad, where someone was attempting to buy drugs from another person and uh, it, it went bad and then violent. What we're also seeing are uh, acquaintance killings, where people who know one another, you know, which is usually 80% of all murder victims anyway, uh, acquaintance killings where people know one another and it escalates into a violent argument that turns violent and then fatal. Uh, that's number two. Uh, we do occasionally see uh, domestic, which are different from acquaintance, but living domestics, where, where one person uh, kills another uh, who's intimately tied to that person in some way. Uh, but we do see a lot of retaliations and people who are tied to one another through either the drug trade or some level of violence that took place between them in the past. Uh, and many of our shooting victims were shooting victims, previous shooting victims, and many of our perpetrators that we catch were shooting victims and tied to their victims in the past. So we know for a fact that there, there, are, there are a high number of retaliatory shootings, acquaintance shootings, and drug deals that have gone bad because one person tried to rob the other person of the drugs uh, in the middle of a drug deal. Instead of just consummating the drug deal, one tried to rob the other. And quite a few of our victims, I would even go as far as to say most of the victims that we find in homicides have a firearm on them, either were in the process of using it or were shot and killed right before they, they could use it. Yeah, so to the point, Commissioner, and I would just you know re reiterate um, the conversation you and I have had and that uh, seems to remain relevant that it, it just feels like given what you just stated about the retaliatory killings and most of the killings being linked to drug deals gone bad, uh, that again, I, I just think that the way we've um, prosecuted the drug war, the way we've, uh, the way we regulate substances in this city and in this country just continues to fail. I was in a health committee hearing this morning um, related to um, looking at emergency shelters and safe injection sites. Um, it, it, it just feels like given that so much of the killing that we see in Baltimore where families lo lose their loved ones have to do with uh, the way narcotics and other drugs are distributed, the underground economy and the way we chase it around, um, to, to me, it just points to a fundamental failure, systems failure um, in how we regulate these drugs. I mean, it, it, you know, it, we're, we're not seeing um, people killing each other over alcohol as, as much. I mean, there's still plenty of domestic violence that takes place alcohol related, but just the level of death within our city to me begs the question of if we keep doing the same thing over and over again, um, you know, are we really going to get a better outcome unless we change policies there? You're muted. I wouldn't deny that there's some truth there. I'd probably even say that there's, that there's likely a lot to be done with what you just said, but I think the core point uh, that I see that, you know, Quite frankly, you know, all the chiefs around the country, what we talk about, the real issue is the, the willingness of the person to use a gun in violence and the availability of those guns and their willingness to use that gun, whether it's acquaintance, whether it's domestic, whether it's drugs, whether it's retaliation, or whether, you know, it's just two people who, who saw one another. It, it, because the decision to pull the trigger is not made when the trigger is pulled. The decision to pull the trigger is made when you grab that gun from under the bed, from under the house, and you walk away out that door with that gun, you know, 
you've predetermined that if you need it, you have it, you're willing to use it. And that is a culture that has grown, grown so strong that we have to really change the reason, change the people's minds about why they think they even need to carry it. And if you know that's the heavy lift that we have to do, uh, what, what you said is absolutely true, but there's a whole way of thinking out there where these young men think that they have to have these guns and, they, and their willingness to use them. Councilman, can you read it? Thank you. I couldn't agree more with that. Again, you know, we know that hurt people hurt people. That's why um, focusing on trauma that people are experiencing, and that's why the they focus deterrence on small number of folks who are consistently committing violent crimes in our city, I think is so important. Um, but I, I just to me, it again speaks to, um, and I'm sure other chiefs around the country, uh, similar dynamics, but just the continued, our continued failed policies when it comes to the drug war um, and the need to, to your point, really treat what is underlying so much of the what you call culture of violence, um, which I think is people's trauma that gets reenacted onto others. Um, but you know, again, uh, I appreciate your work and your commitment to our city. Thank you so much. Thank you. Do we have any other questions from the committee or the council? Going once. Chairman, I, I have two more questions. Go ahead, Councilman. Thank you. Okay. Um, um, Commissioner Harrison, um, um, most of, we, we often hear, and I think you said it even earlier, um, that we need to focus on the bad actors, those, I guess, repeat violent offenders, um, and make certain that we target them. Um, but it, it almost seems like um, every week, um, either through, you know, reports as it relates to uh, homicides or shootings, that um, there is a teen involved um, in so many of the recent, you know, shootings. Are they bad? Are they the bad actors that we're talking about? When I, when I say bad actors, I, I'm talking about people who are actually carrying the guns and pulling the trigger. The people who are pulling the trigger and committing the shootings, committing the robberies, uh, those, you know, committing the other crimes, those are those are, you know, what we would call bad actors, people who are committing violent acts. Uh, so whether it's one person or it's two people together, you know, maybe there's a better terminology I could use, but just academically, we, we talk about people who are the, the, the core group of people committing bad acts. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't have a problem with the terminology. It just appears that um, if we're going after in, that, there are being there are more bad quote unquote bad actors being either recruited or developed faster than we can go after i guess the more seasoned and so if our if our um approach is to go after the repeat violent offenders and go after these bad actors then we better hurry up because they're doing a better job of creating more bad actors than we are at getting you know the the old ones off the street. That's my point. Yeah, but that's and that's a good point. But that's the whole that's the whole principal focus of focus deterrence. It's a two part. It's not just going after the bad actors to to hold them accountable for the bad acts, but it's also offering them an opportunity in their life away from violent crime. We have to actually give them and lead them to the opportunities of fixing their addiction. Uh, dealing with skills and jobs and education and housing and all the other things that, if unaddressed, will drive them to war crime, violence, violent crime specifically. And so that's what it is. It's a two-pronged approach. It's not just the heavy enforcement, but it's the wraparound services to actually give them a whole pathway away from it. And yes, but the first, the first pillar in focus deterrence is prevention. And prevention speaks to the people who are not yet bad actors. It's to prevent the next generation from becoming bad actors. Intervention is for the bad actors. Intervention and enforcement is for the bad actors. And then there's rehabilitation and reentry to prevent people from going back and being repeat offenders and 
being reincarcerated over and over and over. So it, it's multi-pronged. And then with the mayor, the, the, you know, the, the incoming mayor's vision of of wrapping the whole city services around it all, and then pulling out faith-based, our academic institutions, our healthcare institutions, our nonprofits, pulling everybody out of their silos and make everybody a part of this team is, is, is the way we go. But you have to bring them to the opportunities. And for those that don't want it, then yeah, there's enforcement waiting for them. No, um, and, and I appreciate that. And it, and it leads to my, my second and last question is that you know, I, I operated from a position that I assume that you and, and your team are doing everything you can to reduce violence and crime in our city. And um, in your instance, I mean, um, in December, you will you know, be going under your third mayor. And so um, what else, and, and there may be an expectation that you do something else or do something that you're not doing. What, what is it that you have not done or not doing that all of a sudden with the new mayor coming in that you can now do to reduce crime and especially reduce gun violence in the city. Uh, you're muted, sir. I think we've done a lot, and thank you for that. But there's so much more to do. There has been, you know, I, you know, we had support from this administration, but there was transition, and there was transition into a different mayor. And there was transition of people inside the administration in. You know, we've been building this since we put it into the crime plan last June, but it, it has taken time and we've been working with national experts to bring to Baltimore and we had to bring bring on private funding. You heard me talk about is going to the Board of Estimates. We're going to be getting grants from a number of a number of people and, and, and nonprofit organizations to put with city funding to make this work. And so there there have been some barriers along the way, but but we're here, but we are here to do the heavy lift of really fixing the core root issues that, that cause it, which in addition to enforcement and our deployment and improving the department from the inside out is making sure we can actually deal with the addiction, the housing, the education and the skills and lack of jobs. And so, you know, when you put all that together, that's not just a police department initiative. That's a holistic initiative that, that takes a while to build. Um, and that we're we're building. We've been working on it all this time. I never said it was going to be quick. Um, and yeah, there is an expectation that we move fast and that we, you know, we we change this 300 number. Well, that's that's what we're working to do. But that, you know, that that's a heavy, heavy lift, and it takes time because, you know, as I said, we're changing a culture. We're changing a way of thinking, and we're trying to change the reason why people got to go carry guns in the very first place, and then especially using those guns as we fix the police department also. So there, there, there's a lot there, but, but thank you for that. No, thank, thank, you, for, thank you for your service um, and you know, that of you know, all of the men and women in the department. Um, and you know, I was out with about 50 men last night on Pennsylvania Avenue, um, engaging the young men, um, helping to provide jobs and resources. And we're committed to be your partners and continue to do that um, through the winter, all through next year. Um, we see we see um, your your goal, your strategy is a part of our goals and strategy. And so um, we know it's a team effort. So um, um, this will probably be the last time that I get a chance to to acknowledge you as as far as a hearing. So I, I just en enjoyed working with you and um, continue to keep you in my prayers. You in the department. So thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's, it's been an absolute pleasure, and I, I appreciate your, your friendship. I appreciate your partnership, and I appreciate your leadership. God bless you and your family. Thank you. Uh, do any other members of the council or committee have any questions for the department? Nope. Okay, so um, first off, I do want to also, I'm sorry we didn't start with this, but I'll close out with this. I do want to thank you, Commissioner Harrison, and your team um, for everything that you guys are doing. Uh, certainly, we've seen a tremendous difference uh, from last year to this year um, at all of the actions you guys have been taking, um, walking and chewing gum at the same time, implementing the change that's necessary, but also, uh, and most importantly to me that I've seen, um, is how quickly your team has adapted to crime trends 
um, and your colonels have, uh, you know, have been giving the, the weekly briefings. And what we've seen is just that there's been um, a tremendous uh, amount of quick action by your team that I have, I have not seen in my, my first years on the council. Uh, but I'm seeing now, and it definitely gives me hope and encouragement that uh, that things are are going to continue to go in the right direction. Uh, my district appreciates that, and I know the other districts across the city do. Um, as you know, we've been uh, we've had a lot of different armed carjackings and and robberies, and um, and some of the issues continue. But there's also been a lot of arrests that have been made and a lot of action taken. It's also been quick action, and that's the most important. Um, you know that 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 happens. Uh, in the beginning, rather than in, in, you know, takes me back to 2017 when I just joined the council, we had a similar trend. Uh, it took uh, many, many months before the actions that your team has taken in a matter of days. Um, and so I want to thank you guys for that. Also give a special shout out to Michelle, uh, who we all drive absolutely crazy on a day to day basis. But uh, she's been excellent at getting us answers, um, which is also why these hearings have been a lot easier. Uh, than they have been in previous years. So thank you, and uh, thank you to uh, just the entire department who uh, who's there for us on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, my Thanksgiving, I will be spending the same way I've spent um, multiple Thanksgivings uh, pretty much every year for the past, I think, seven or eight years now, which is uh, bringing food to the districts, to the officers that are working, uh, to thank them for their service. Thank you whole council and happy thanksgiving may god bless you and keep you all safe all right thank you we are now in recess happy thanksgiving thank you